they wanted to do them. And we've got to keep that in mind when we're looking at what Noel says, because our students are slightly different from that. But in adragogy, the content of the learning is dictated by perceived need. The learner learns because they see the need to, not because somebody tells them that's what they ought to learn. The method of learning is selected by the learner, and the pace of learning is dictated by the learner. We do have a problem because we do, as people training professionals, have a certain content which we know that the students have to learn. At least we believe they have to learn if they're going to practice medicine safely. So we can't just allow the student to learn what they want to learn. The trick is that we can show them what it is they need to learn, so that from their point of view, they're learning it because of perceived need, and from our point of view, we are directing them to the right things that they need to learn. Knowles uh, went on to, to sort of describe the adult learner. It has got graced with the title of adult learning theory. It is not really a theory. It's purely a qualitative description of what happens. Adults in their learning have a specific purpose in mind. Now, our medical students do have a specific purpose in mind. They want to become doctors. Adults are voluntary participants in learning. And again, although we may have compulsory sessions, in a sense, the learners are voluntary because they want to be at medical school. They could have done something else if they, if they had wanted. They require meaning and relevance. They require active involvement in learning. They need clear goals and objectives. They need feedback and they need to be reflective. A lot of medical education has been based on this perception of what adult, adults need to know. But as I say, this is not really a theory in the strictest sense, um, because the data to back it up is rather weak. If we look at true learning theories, they fall into two categories, the individualistic ones, which are based on psychology, and the social constructivist ones, which take a more sociological approach. I want to just briefly review some of these areas. Under the individualistic ones, there's theories of cognition, theories of motivation, and theories of experiential learning. Under the social constructivist models, there are theories of situated learning, theories of communities of practice, and theories of reflective practice. Let's just review those quickly. There are lots of cognition theories about learning. For example, the information processing theory. All of them recognize the, the need for the activation of prior knowledge. Um, and in the information uh, processing theory, it takes a sort of information, uh, information theory approach and looks at the notion of encoding specificity. So the new material you are learning which is in your short-term memory, is transferred into your long-term memory in association with the prior knowledge which you've also activated. This is an important concept when you start thinking about how do we teach students, because we know that we, we've all experienced having students on the ward, asking them about anatomy, and finding they don't know it, and yet they passed their anatomy exams. Have they forgotten it all? No, it is still there somewhere in the long-term memory banks. It's just that it is not associated with the area that we are uh, questioning them about. So they need to be able to link their basic science in such a way that they can access it in a useful way for clinical practice. Encoding specificity is important. After the encoding specificity, the next stage is the elaboration of knowledge. So you take that new piece of knowledge, add it to your old piece of knowledge, and you use it to make a jump and to elaborate the knowledge. You don't just recall the facts, you wind them into a, a, real, a, a new semantic network where you understand more than you did before. The implication of this is that if you are going to teach people You've got to teach them in the context in which they're going to use the material. So our sequential approach to medical education is actually flying contrary to the way people learn. I should emphasize that when we're talking about learning theories, these are not descriptions of how things ought to be. These are descriptions of how things actually are. Whether they're accurate or not is another question, 
but they are not an attempt to say this is how you should do it. They are saying this is how people learn. And the reality is that people learn things in the context in which they're going to use them. If we look then at the group of theories related to motivation, Williams came up with uh, something called the self-determination theory, and motivation is, uh, motivators are detected into, uh, divided into two sorts, controlled motivators and autonomous motivators. Controlled motivators have all to do with external rewards or internalized contingencies, things that you ought to do. Does this sound terribly like the medical curriculum? What is it that drives the students? The external rewards of passing their exams. Or the peer pressure and the teacher pressure that this is the kind of student you ought to be. You ought to be working hard. You ought to be studying uh, a long time. The trouble with that sort of motivation is that it leads to pressure and anxiety. It leads to rote learning. It leads to short-term memory of the material. And there is very poor integration of the material into the student's values and skills. Do you recognize that picture of what is going on with medical students? Autonomous motivators, on the other hand, are things that are personally endorsed by the students. The student learns them not because they're told they have to or in order to pass the exams, but because intrinsically they find them interesting and they think they're important. And that is characteristic, characterized by volition, by agency, and by choice. The student is learning because they want to learn. They are learning because they are choosing these things to learn. Now, if we compare the learning that takes place through controlled and autonomous learning, under the autonomous learner in comparison to the, uh, the autonomous motivation in comparison to the control motivation, produces greater understanding of the material that's learned. It produces a better performance in the student afterwards. It gives the student stronger feelings of competence and it produces enhanced creativity and there are a whole list of other minor advantages. There is a corollary to it. If you are going to have autonomous learners, then the student's perspective has to be acknowledged. If the student says to you, I don't think it is worthwhile me learning that, rather than saying you have to learn it because I say you have to learn it, you have to have a proper discussion with the student as to why you think this is important. The corollary of that is that the student has to accept responsibility for their learning. You all know the student who complains that they failed the exams because they weren't taught something. If we are going to have autonomous learners, you have got to have students who are prepared to take responsibility. You can say to them quite legitimately, well, if you didn't learn it, it's your fault. The corollary of that is the teacher's answers must be satisfactory. When the student asks a question, the teacher must give a satisfactory answer. Now, a satisfactory answer does not mean that the teacher tells the student what the right answer is because sometimes a good student will ask a question to which you do not know the answer. 